the unbound, unbound by fear, united by bravery, enigmatic level, Hephaestus's forge, survival difficulty, class zero, exit, zero out of five, guaranteed exit, environment, zero out of five, no environmental risk, entities, zero out of five, no hostile entities, description, Hephaestus's forge, known also as HF, or simply the forge, is a vital level of interest for the coalition, owing to its extraordinary adaptability, habitable conditions, and abundant resource opportunities, it has been officially classified as a clandestine enigmatic level with potential for establishment as an industrial colony in the future. This level is subject to the dominion of a powerful entity, designated EHF-1, who wields a measurable influence over its entirety. Consequently, the cooperation and accord of EHF-1 is of paramount importance to our operations. Spatial Architecture The forge is spatially malleable. Its architecture is fluid, and its appearance relies almost entirely on the whims of EHF-1. At present, its structure resembles an atrium. Moreover, the level has no end. It continues indefinitely, and can accommodate as many subdimensions as necessary. However, its stability has been noted to depend entirely on EHF-1's subjective emotional state. When she is fatigued or upset, HF may be subject to unpredicted changes, including potential damage to our assets. It is imperative, therefore, that the emotional stability of EHF-1 be carefully monitored and controlled to sustain the Coalition's interests. Initial entry to the Forge typically occurs through the creation of a new subdimension. Individuals setting foot onto the level for the first time are greeted with an environment suited to their needs and inclinations. Footnote i.e. incorporating features such as their favorite colors, preferred style of decor, hobby-slash-interests, and familiar-slash-comforting locations, e.g. one's past room, and footnote. A permanent psychic link is established upon the moment of contact between the host individual entering and the subdimension entered. Each subdimension thus functions as an individual's private quarters within the level. Upon request, EHF-1 is further able to modify subdimensions to suit an individual's needs and preferences, though operatives rarely seem to find this necessary. Access from subdimensions into one another, the main atrium, and the wider backrooms is achieved through mirrors functioning as cross-dimensional portals. Mirrors leading from one part of the level into another may be manipulated at the leisure of the subdimension's host. Though entrances and exits to the Forge overall remain in EHF-1's sole and total control, the central atrium is a common area accessible to all individuals in the Forge. It holds most key UEC assets and resources, carrying both current and projected future industrial coalition operations. Assets and Resources Specimen EHF-1's abilities and their activation upon the Forge have proven invaluable for UEC purposes. In addition to the capabilities thus far described, its immense powers further include Spontaneous Generation of Resources Ex Nihilo, footnote, i.e. out of nothing, and footnote, and at will, physical invulnerability applied to all Forge occupants, Infliction of bodily harm is impossible, apart from direct and deliberate human action, though this too may be impeded by EHF-1's intervention. Biological invulnerability that is similarly applied, disease cannot occur or spread within the forge, though existing conditions are not cured upon entry. Nevertheless, EHF-1 is able to intelligently apply medical knowledge for the synthesis of a variety of clinical drugs, allowing for effective treatment of the afflicted. Flawless security, utter impregnability, no clip in slash out of the level is entirely impossible. 
Entry and exit is strictly regulated by EHF-1 alone, inhibiting unauthorized access and safeguarding key coalition resources. Efficient travel. EHF-1 is able to open and move mirror portals above the back rooms at will. The forge may therefore act as a gateway across distant locations. Image caption. State-of-the-art steel mill within Hephaestus's forge. Weapons production has doubled in efficiency since its construction. In view of the above, the forge's vast potential has been harnessed for UEC industrial supply operations. EHF-1's abilities are now consistently utilized for the production and storage of rare raw materials, as well as provisions for human sustenance. Moreover, though EHF-1 requires time for recuperation, machinery generated by the entity may operate independently and run indefinitely. Within mere weeks of its discovery, the Forge has become a central weapons production node for the Coalition, with three heavy arms factory facilities operating at maximum output efficiency, and several more under construction. EHF-1 does, however, possess troublesome tendencies, and has expressed unease with regards to arms production activities. If questioned, personnel are strictly to insist that weapons are supplied for defensive, entity deterrent purposes only. Footnote. Acceptable and effective turns of phrase include, this is for the greater good, and the valuable out there need something that they can use to protect themselves. End footnote. Image Caption Illustration of Specimen EHF-1, nicknamed Ghostly, by Coalition personnel. Specimen has adamantly refused to allow photographic capture. Attention! Personnel Directive Careful monitoring and control of Specimen EHF-1 is essential for Coalition purposes. When conversing with EHF-1, do Affirm the specimen's commitment to the assistance and protection of vulnerable individuals. Monitor and preserve EHF-1's efficiency. Be as strict as needed. Reinforce the hostility of non-human entities and the need for their total eradication. Refer to the UEC strictly as the Coalition in its presence. Optimize and automate production whenever possible to reduce dependency on the specimen. Remind the entity of the accommodations the UEC has made for its temperamental emotional state. Avoid Describing or displaying recognizable features, e.g. insignia, colony names, which may reveal our organization's identity to the specimen. Feeding into the entity's troublesome behavior. Please distress as needed but do not avoid harshness. Committing open acts of brutality in the entity's presence. Above all, the specimen must not be informed of the intended usage of manufactured weaponry. Origins Input Credits Access Granted Case Study Olivia Belrose Image Caption Photograph of Operative Belrose Recovered from Meg Documents Caution Access to this document is restricted. Any unauthorized attempt to view its contents will be met with severe consequences. Following the raid on Meg Base Beta, confidential documents have been recovered regarding one Operative Belrose, who has been employed by the Meg for numerous years before her resignation and untimely death. According to Meg reports, Olivia Belrose, a middle-aged woman of French-Canadian descent, was reported KIA after a supposed entity attack shortly following her departure from the group. Curiously, Belrose bears a striking resemblance to entity EHF-1, sharing notable physical features such as their hair color, eye color, and body shape. Furthermore, EHF-1's injuries align with the supposed method of attack inflicted on the late agent. Notably, Belrose was heavily associated with her companion, Thornasol, who had in turn passed away a few months prior under muddy circumstances, as evidenced by the impossibility of assessing any specific parts of the document regarding this individual, critical information regarding Tornasol remains under high clearance, raising concerns about what the Meg is hiding. Further investigation into this person of interest is pending. 
Given the glaring similarities in appearance and injuries, it raises questions about whether EHF-1 is concealing the truth regarding their identity. Extracting the facts from EHF-1 is of utmost priority to uncover the specimen's potentially questionable motives. End classified document. Bases, outposts, and communities. Currently, a large facility is under construction with the assistance of Entity EHF-1. Prospective plans entail the conversion of the entire level into a UEC community, potentially rendering it one of the most expansive communities restricted to a singular level. The forthcoming base is slated to achieve the distinction of being the preeminent UEC establishment, primarily devoted to the training of operatives in combat techniques, employing armaments fabricated on site. Additionally, it will serve as a central hub for the transshipment of essential materials and resources to subsidiary bases distributed across all occupied levels. Entrances and Exits Entrances Access to the forge is predominantly achieved through approaching and no-clipping into one of the numerous mirrors distributed by EHF-1 throughout the backrooms. In cases of physical injury or imminent peril to an individual's life, there exists the possibility that a mirror will spontaneously manifest beneath them, facilitating their immediate transfer into the aforementioned level. Other means of access have yet to be confirmed. Exits there exists no manually accessible exit within the level. The exclusive authority to generate an egress from the premises rests solely within EHF-1. You all used me. The Back Rooms. Home. Section 1. Memory. Red. Hey, Turnisol, wait up, you're so unfair. Blue. Oops, sorry, force of habit. Too used to running around in beast mode. And we're here. Red. Whoa. Look at the sky. And the stars. This is amazing. Blue. Hey, I thought you'd like somewhere quiet. Especially after running around as a hero all day. Red. This reminds me of nighttime back in the countryside. The sky was always full of stars. Just like this. Thank you, my sweet snowball. Thank you so much for spending so much time to find this place. Just for me. I really mean it. Blue. You know I'd do anything for you. I love you, and I always will. I love you more than the whole world. <laughs> hey, Rose. Red. Hmm? Blue. Do you ever think about the future? Red. Hmm. Yeah, what about it? Blue. I've been thinking, we should start a little garden on the level of our dreams, with tomatoes and apple trees and all sorts of flowers and, oh, our own bulb cat. Red. Aw, I love that idea. And what do you think our house will look like? Blue. Hmm. You know what? I don't think I'd want it to look the same all the time. I think I'd want it to be specially tailored, if you know what I mean. Maybe if you walk in, the walls will change into that bright pink color you love. And if I walk in, it'll turn all blue and winter-themed. You know, something that'll resonate with both of us. Red. Oh, and all our guests will see what they like, too. That sounds awesome, Sonny. You're a genius. Blue. Ah, you'll make me blush. It was just a thought. I just want our home to be a safe place. Our own little hideout. Red. You know I like to make you blush. When I do, your horns poke out of your hair. Blue. Mm, you make fun of me all the time. How mean. Red. Sorry. Blue. Eh, I'm just messing with you. You know I love it when you tease me. But yeah, I want a place to call home. A place where we love dearly. Where we can just run away from all our worries and everything. Where you and I can just be us together. We'll work hard and make it come true. I promise. For you and for me. For both of us. Pinky promise? Red. Geez, still making pinky promises? You never grow up, huh? Blue. Aw, come on, I'm being serious. Red. Of course, my little snowball. Hey, come here. I love you so much. Blue. I love you too, Rose. Oh, it's getting late. We should get going soon. Section 2. Hope. Red. It's so dark. I don't know where I am. I can't feel my legs. I can't even see my legs. Wait, where's the rest of my body? I... I remember it. 
How do I remember it? I died. No, 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 no. Please, don't let this be the afterlife. It can't just be, it can't just end like this. I have a promise to keep. I can't abandon our dream. No, no, that's not, that can't be right. I'm, I'm thinking right now. So maybe I'm not dead, dead. But even if that's true, I'm just as good as. Maybe it's only my mind left, stuck in this void. It's just so empty and I can't move. I'm stuck. Pink, you are right to say that this is your consciousness. And no, you are not dead. Only your body is. Your mind and soul live on. You are still here thanks to me. But I certainly wouldn't have been able to save you if you didn't fight with so much determination to live on. Because of the promise you made, you won't disappear. Red, who are you? I don't know your voice. Why are you so bright? How are you here? Wait, I saw you. You were there while I was dying. You did something, and I woke up. You gave me strength. Please, tell me how I can go back. You must know. Please, you brought me back to life. I have to go back. Pink, I am Philia. It was indeed I who witnessed your last moments, and I could not stand idly by and watch you lose in your fight to live. I am the answer to your cry and the guardian of your promise. That is who I am. As for going back, that is something that will take time. I am, unfortunately, unable to give you a body in my present condition. I have never encountered a case like this before. It is odd. The mind was saved, but the body was left behind. In terms of your future, the path you will forge for yourself, I know you will find a way to be reborn, to continue your quest on your own. I am not strong enough to do so for you. You were the one who survived because of your will. If your beliefs, that part of you will be offered up as a sacrifice of love, continue to fight on for that which it seeks, I am confident that you will endure all that may come your way. I am sorry that I cannot do any more than this. I am sorry that these answers must be confusing. But you will go back. I know you will find a way. And if I regain my strength, I will surely help you. Red, I don't understand. And yet, I want to trust you. You helped me, and... I fought to stay alive. And if there's even a remote chance that I can return to my old life, then I will fight on for it, no matter what the cost. Whatever it takes, I will figure it out. The second chance you have given me is the only hope I can cling to. I will be strong. Pink, I know that you will be strong. You always have been. I am sorry. My time grows short. I must return to stasis. When you are reborn, come find me. That is my only request. I will try to watch over you, my dear one. Do not ever lose hope. There is always a second chance, a second path, a way to survive. I made a mistake once. Do not be like me. Do not let grief consume you and prevent you from doing the right thing. Never let anybody drain you of your determination to endure for the sake of love. You have suffered greatly, but I will ask that you push through. And I am sure that you will. My time has come. I must bid you farewell. Red. I'm confused. There's so much I don't understand. Ugh, my head hurts. I don't know if I'll ever get used to this ghost body and everything else. There's still so much I don't know. All I know for sure is that I made it out alive somehow, and I won't waste that chance. I'll do it for you, Tornasol. Image Caption Juntador Moncheli Section 3 Beginning Red I spent most of today on the floor. I didn't have anything to do, after all. I was still thinking about what Philia told me before she disappeared. Then, I thought about food. I couldn't feel hungry without my old body, but I wished I could bite into a tasty red apple just one last time. And that was when a red apple appeared. When I thought about it hard enough, imagining the shape, the texture, the taste, it simply popped into existence, right in front of me, out of nowhere. When I held it in my hands, it felt exactly like a real apple. Although I couldn't eat it, 
I knew it was real, and I had created it from nothing but my thoughts, just like Tornasol could. So I tried to make more things. A lamp, a pencil, a scarf. It took a bit of effort, but one by one, they all materialized before me, just as I had imagined them. Was this Philia's doing? Somehow, under the same circumstances that are keeping me alive, I seem to have acquired a strange set of powers. Perhaps the same powers as my lost love. But how? If they are watching over me, if they are part of the reason why I'm still alive, I need to learn how to master these abilities. Perhaps then I could create a way to flee. For now, I'll redecorate this place. It's rather bland. Oh, I know, I'll make it look just like that special home of our dreams, with a nice garden of sunflowers, a farm, and a house that changes its look to match who's inside. It will take a while, but I can do it. I have learned my limits. It seems that the larger the things I make are, the more I'm drained of energy. Somehow, even though my body is gone, I can still get tired out. Because of this, it's taken me many days to set everything up, but in the end, I did it. My dearest Sunny, if you're watching, our dream house has come true, though it is pretty empty. If only I could have a bit of company here. If I get better at controlling these powers, then maybe I could let in other people to live here. And since I seem to be in control of everything in it, nobody would risk getting hurt. It'd be a haven for wanderers to settle in, just like the base we were planning to build. I wonder just how far I can push my capabilities. I wonder if I can create something completely out of this world. Maybe a flying fish, pink snow, or maybe, even, an exit back home. But I'm all worn out now, and I doubt I can achieve all that just yet. I get exhausted after creating simple things, so I shouldn't be too ambitious, I guess. For now, I'm wondering if there's a way to let people in from the outside. Since I'm still alive, there must be a way for me to reach into the physical world. Perhaps portals? Like the ones I've heard about from the Red Knight? But then I wouldn't be able to see what's on the other side. Hmm. Oh, I know. Two-way mirrors. That way, I can see what's on the other side, and the person on the other side can see what's in here. They'll know that this place is safe. That's a genius move. Well, let's see. I'll make it so whoever touches the mirror will be sucked in. If someone is in danger, this would be a great way to assure an escape route. If only I could let people know about this. I'll have to deal with it for now. Maybe I can figure out a solution in the future. For now, I'll wait. Maybe I'll just sit and think. It's so quiet without anyone else. I miss the noise. And the more I'm alone, the more the memories won't go away. I can still see them in my thoughts. It's terrifying. It hurts. It worked! I started today by creating my very first mirror. Just as I thought, it really does lead to the world outside. The mirror opened right into level zero, and it was the real level zero, not just another product of my thoughts. When I tried to create something beyond the mirror, it didn't work, so it had to be the real world outside. I could move the mirror that I made through the air infinitely in any direction. I could even reach through the mirror and touch the yellow walls. I can hardly describe the relief I'm feeling. If I can still interact with the world, then I have to be alive. I don't think I can leave and step out, though. When my hand went through the portal, it felt weird. I didn't like it. I don't think I can leave and come back easily. This realm I'm in is my consciousness in physical form, after all. Anyway, once I'd figured out how to create the mirrors, I sent a few of them out to different levels in search of wanderers, and someone came in pretty quickly. Finally, I'm not alone. It was a little girl wearing a hospital gown. She looked so frightened. I can't imagine how scared she must have been when she no-clipped into a scary new realm, being lost in those endless concrete halls, all alone. It must have been pretty awful. I've promised myself that I will take care of her at any cost. Her name is Sally, and she's nine years old. She told me that before she'd gotten lost, she was in a hospital to get treatment for a bad disease. But she's not entirely sure what it is. After all, she's so young, her parents were probably afraid to tell her. When I came to her aid, she was absolutely in awe. The environment here instantly changed completely to look like a fairy tale castle, so I made her a beautiful dress and created all kinds of toys for her. A castle needs a princess to rule it after all. And I gave her a warm bath, a royal feast, and a cozy bed to rest. She's asleep now, but she still has the biggest smile on her face. It makes me feel warm inside. Ever since she arrived, making her smile has been all that mattered to me. I think she got attached to me pretty quickly. Ghosty, 
That's the name she gave to me. Since it makes her so happy, I suppose it won't hurt to keep it. Although it's a little silly, I don't mind. I want to protect her. I'll even figure out a way to treat her disease. I'm sure of it. I picked up quite a bit of medical knowledge back in the Meg, and I can create anything here, so there must be a way that I can break all that's known to reality and cure her illness. I won't let anyone else die on my watch. Not again. I promise, Sally. She made a drawing of the two of us. She said she wants to become an artist. I'm just realizing how much she reminds me of myself when I was younger. So full of life and hope and wonder. I will preserve her dreams. I have to. I will make sure they become a reality. Over the past few days, me and Sally have been spending lots of time together. I use my energy to create an entire room full of art supplies, paint, brushes, and canvas boards. Oh, she was so happy. She spent hours in there. She was mixing colors and drawing the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen. Sometimes I feel like she could be my daughter. I'm getting so attached to her. I'm sewing little dresses for her too. Just like I did before. No, that's not important right now. She told me a secret too. She said that she'd always wanted a pet, but her parents couldn't afford one. It's no surprise. The treatment for her disease must have cost a fortune. I tried to make her a cat, but what came out was weirdly empty. It was still and lifeless and looked almost like a mannequin. So, all thanks to Sally, I figured out another limit to my powers. It seems like I can't quite create full-fledged living beings that breathe and move and act like their real counterparts. So, I had to get creative. I made her an animated stuffed cat toy that can move around and purr, and she loved it. She named it Marigold, and she's taking good care of it. She's so responsible for her age, she makes sure to place food in its bowl, and she watches to make sure it doesn't get hurt. However, I've noticed that Sally is starting to get tired more often. She struggles to stay awake most of the time, and I'm starting to worry about what might happen if I don't create a cure fast enough. No, I'm sure I can make it. I just need to concentrate and keep trying, even if it'll exhaust me. I can't disappoint her, not after she's told me about all the wonderful things she wants to do when she grows up. She's still so young, and once I cure her, she'll be happy, or at least I'll try my best to make her happy. I'll do everything I can, even if her parents aren't here, and even if this isn't her home. I know how it feels, to be ripped away from your home at such a young age, to be forced to get used to such an unfamiliar place, but she will never be sad. I will make sure of it. I won't fail her like I failed myself. Section 4. Meeting. I came up with a cure, and it seems to be working. Sally is feeling better. She says she doesn't feel any pain now. If I just put more energy into it, I'll be able to cure her completely. I just need to work a little bit more. She's so happy, although she's still tired. She's not in as much pain. She can go around and happily play in the gardens. She can paint and draw again. She seems so grateful to me, and I won't let it get any worse, even if I'm exhausted. She's just so close. I just need a few more days. Then I should be able to create something even more powerful to treat her. She will let her hair grow again, once it's all over. Then she will have the hair of a beautiful princess. Then we will bake a cake together, and we will also celebrate with a tea party. Another good news is that more people have started to come to this place. Now that I think of it, I should give it a name since it can be considered a level. I know the perfect name. Level Tornasol. A place where everyone can live without fear of being harmed, without ever starving or feeling lost. The exact place we always wanted to make together. I wonder if you are proud of me. I wonder if one day, I will feel that I've completely fulfilled our promise. Thornasol, wherever you are right now, know that your hopes will never be shattered. I will make this realm a better place. I will take care of the innocents like we both desired, so that nobody will ever go through what we did and we will be happy. I am happy. It's been a while since I felt this way. Doubt still lingers in my mind, but I won't let it get to me. They need me. Ever since I started giving Sally her dose of pills, she has been getting less pale. Just recently, her tiredness was gone too. I can't believe things are getting better and better, and this is only just the start. Just a few days ago, a man wearing a uniform arrived on my level. At first, he seemed pretty afraid of me. But we had a long talk about my purpose, and about the things I can do that seemed to truly spark his interest, specifically when he got to know about my abilities. 
He asked all kinds of questions regarding the level and its limits, such as if I was able to create endless food. His face visibly lit up once I mentioned that the level is infinite and that it can store all kinds of things. He told me he comes from a group known as the Coalition, and that they have a mission to protect wanderers by creating a haven for them, which aligns perfectly with what I want to do. He even said that they already have a few places that are under their protection. I was worried at first. I didn't have the best experience with the Meg, but it seems that they aren't affiliated in any way. The Coalition seems to be my only outside help for now. He promised that he'd return soon, with other agents, to start settling in and examine the level. He would let everyone know about this place. Maybe, through our collaboration, they can direct wanderers to the mirror portals, which would lead them here more easily. And, a bit of help in taking care of the resources would also take some responsibilities off of my shoulders. Since they have quite a few bases, we could also potentially build a system of exploration resources, so people who are settled in other levels can still have their needed necessities without needing them to come here. I forgot to ask his name, but he has already left. Hopefully, he will return soon enough so we can have a proper meeting. I'm excited to see more people interested in my cause. And, with a big enough group by my side, things will get even better. Sally, however, seemed a bit afraid of him. It's normal though, she's gotten used to the same people every day, so seeing a stranger is probably a bit frightening. I reassured her that things will go smoothly, and that this is a great occasion to help more people. I'm glad she's feeling less uneasy now. She's willing to trust them. She started to refer to me as her older sister, and I don't mind. I've always been an only child, so having a younger sibling to look after makes me feel happy, even if it's inside this realm. I need to make sure I don't get too exhausted though, because if I get too caught up with collaborating with the Coalition, I may forget to focus on other important things. But I can do it. Multitasking is just my thing, an Olivia Belrose skill. Section 5. Exhaustion It's been a few days since members of the Coalition started coming in groups. The man I met first also returned, and I know his name now, Jack Warren. Apparently, he's one of the higher-ups. How lucky. They've been taking notes ever since they stepped in here. I was given a bunch of requests, and I was able to fulfill them. It seems they have plans to construct a bunch of large facilities inside of the level. These facilities would have machines that automatically produce food and things like that. It would take less energy from me, and it would significantly speed up the process. Then, I heard them discuss creating a large base inside of the level too. Since I can technically create exits to anywhere, this base would be a useful gateway between other outposts of theirs. Although, I'm worried that they may be a bit wary of me. I suppose it's because I am not exactly a human being anymore, am I? I am not Olivia Belrose anymore, but ghosty. But that's fine, it's understandable. It's already a lot that they've trusted me to come here. It seems that they will store everything about my level in their private database, and then they will make it public once everything has been prepared and settled. I ought to rest more, because from now on, I'll have to work as hard as I can. I need to be of use until I leave this place. But what happens after I'm strong enough to flee this place? For now, it doesn't matter. I'm sure I'll be able to make this realm continue to exist. I can't wait for time to pass quickly and I can't wait for Sally's recovery to reach its ending point. I wish to see her smile like this every day. My dear sister, she is letting her hair grow now, long and blonde. She even asked me to style it. She's now truly a princess. Just another week and anything malignant in her body will be gone. Progress is happening fast. The factories have been built, and the construction of the base has started. But I'm beginning to worry, because the members of the Coalition are very demanding. I've started to lose strength more often. I can't produce as many things as I did before. And then, just, they don't like it. I know they must be disappointed. I'm trying everything I can, but I can't keep up. They want me to produce weapons, guns specifically, but I'm starting to think that these guns won't be used solely to protect others. I'm also struggling to keep up with the production of Sally's pills. I'll have to make more later. Some of the wanderers are starting to feel uneasy near them. They always tell me that they act as if they own them and this place. They don't let any of the wanderers out of their sight, and it's starting to frighten them. They speak of the wanderers as things, as vermins. Vermins that they collect for respect and power, to become well known, and to have absolute control. 
In the way they look at me, it feels as if I'm a tool, a monster, useful only for creating until exhaustion. I don't know if I can trust them anymore. I don't know if they truly want to help others as they say. They speak cruelly about entities. They asked me to create weapons made entirely of iron. Weapons that can kill specific entities. When I asked the other wanderers about them, they were confused as to why they would make such requests to kill non-hostile beings. Sally won't let them get close to me. She's worried about me and insists that I must take a break. She doesn't like how they're behaving and is afraid of them, but I reassured her that it'll be okay. I know that they probably don't understand my limits, and I will just need to clear up any misunderstanding. She still seems pretty reluctant about it, but I made sure to let her know that it'll be fine. I know that this is our only possibility for some kind of outside connection. I know some of them aren't like this. Maybe it's their leaders who are influencing them to behave so harshly. I don't want them to scare wanderers and harm those who did nothing wrong. I know that they will understand, and that this can be resolved peacefully. All I want is to create peace. I don't want this kind of conflict. Oh, Tornasol, please, give me some strength. Section 6. Grief. Why? 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 I thought... I thought I was doing everything right. It was working. Why? She told me it was okay. She told me she wanted to sleep. And I didn't stop her. I thought it was going to be alright. She's gone. She's... She's gone. I couldn't create enough pills. I was tired. I was too tired. I didn't have enough energy. And she... I couldn't save her. I couldn't. It's all my fault. It won't go away. No matter how much I scrub it off, I still feel dirty. I feel incompetent. The guilt. Sally. My dear sister, I couldn't protect you. I made you promises that I couldn't keep. It's all my fault. I just couldn't put in enough strength. All the things I had to make. If only... If only I wasn't so pathetic. You just wanted to grow up. You were just a child. Why? Why did you have to die? Why? Why can't I ever save anyone? No matter what I do, I can't... Everyone I loved died. Everyone I loved was taken away. And it's all because I'm weak. A weak and stupid person who was never strong enough. I just, I just want to go back. I just want to bring Sally back. I can't bring her back because I can't even use my powers right. I can never use my abilities right. I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Sally. Pl forgive me. Forgive me for this mistake. I shouldn't have trusted them. I never should have. Never trusted them. From the moment they came to my level, I should have known that they wanted to use me, and only use me. I know everything now. I buried Sally in her favorite place. And then this man that I had seen a couple of times before offered to help me. A man in a uniform with a kind voice. I don't know why he would risk his own life, but seeing the grief I was going through may have caused him to feel pity. When I told him about Sally, he decided to uncover the lies that I'd been put through all this time. He told me the truth about the goal of the Coalition. They're a bunch of dirty entity exterminators that create controlled communities to try and monopolize the back rooms. Their real identity is known as the radicalized Team Blade that is part of the UEC group. Their only goal here was to turn my level into a weaponry full of resources for their own sake. They never shared any of the resources with wanderers in need. They use these weapons to harm others and take over small bases and areas. They've dug around my past, stealing documents and doing everything to discover the origins of my powers. They are sick, all of them. They want to take everything as their own. Because of them, Sally is dead, and because of them, I've been exhausted for months. They destroyed everything I cared about. I won't tolerate their presence here any longer. I will kick them out one by one. They will never return. I will do this for Sally and everyone else. I'm sorry I didn't figure this out sooner. I'm sorry. But I will make sure to right my wrongs and to fix what they've broken. They won't use this place as a way to cause harm any longer. I will protect those who are left, no matter what it takes. They're all gone. All of them. They killed everyone. I wasn't able to send them away fast enough. This was their revenge. Because they lost their power because I dared to tell them to leave, to call them out for their cruelty. I couldn't do anything. Those weapons I made for them, they used them against the Wanderers. An act of revenge. A sick, twisted revenge against me. 
Their blood is on my hands. I am covered in their blood. It will never go away. Never, never, never. No matter how much I wish it would go away. It's all my fault. Sally, Tornasol, the Wanderers. I'm a broken machine that can never do its job right. I can't die. I can't be free. I can't help anyone. I am stuck and I am all alone again. Philia must think I am pathetic. She worked so hard to keep me alive and I failed her. I failed everyone. It's quiet, bloody, cold. There's no laughter anymore, no noise, nothing. I want to go back home to my mother and father. How childish, I don't even have a home. I was never strong enough. I was just afraid to die. And now I stay alone in this prison of mine. I'm sorry. Section 7. C'est la vie. Footnote. That's just how life is. End footnote. Quand le mood semble se tourner côté toi, sèche que ça n'est pas la casse. Regarde vers les tournesols de tout à l'heure. Chaque quils ne se tourne jamais les capteurs. Dans la toise de toi, l'herbe tu à toi, tu fais les fesses. Sèche que tu ne seras jamais les plus dans les disclés. Si ta vision commence à s'y s'obscurir, pense juste à tous les cadeaux que la vie a pu tout à faire. Que quoi sur le bar vers laquelle tout va périr. La tonne so comme le notre fleurier, tu pas tout au ton doule. Et dans ce pièce vira tout serine en sécurité. I remembered it. I thought I forgot how to sing in French. I remembered her voice as she sang to me. This little song is the only part I have left of my humanity and of my happier days, the only memory. Mom, Dad, I wonder where both of you are right now. Are you still searching for me? Do you miss me? I miss you. I miss Sally. I miss the others. And I miss my life outside of here. Just for a moment, I wish I could go back. Back to when I was a kid. Back when I had everything I cherished here with me. But I can't go back. My life will continue here in solitude. Forever.